I'd like to take a moment to introduce our event moderator, uh, Dr. Margaret Margie Arnold. Um, she spent over 25 years in higher education as a faculty member in academic administration. As a former Division I collegiate student athlete, Margie played basketball and soccer at the University of New Hampshire, where she received her bachelor's before moving on to earn her master's degree in recreation administration from Florida State University. Um, and her PhD in leisure studies from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Margie was a faculty member at SUNY Cortland and Ithaca College, where she taught for many years before moving into administrative positions, chairing two academic departments, serving as Dean of Graduate Studies, and Associate Provost for Academic Programs, among other positions. Uh, Dr. Arnold has co-authored two textbooks, published 20 articles, and delivered over 100 academic presentations. In her role as presidential spouse, Margie engages with student organizations, hosts and attends alumni and donor events with the president, and works closely with the Office of Advancement in Athletics to support student athletes and cultivate alumni and donor relations. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to presidential spouse, Dr. Margie Arnold. Thank you, Thank you. Ashley. Great. So welcome, everyone. So glad that you are here with us this evening. Um, there we are. Hi, everyone. So first of all, before we begin, I want to thank three people who helped pull this together. They did a remarkable job. And that is Ashley, who you just met with the introduction. Ashley, if you don't know, um, heads the women's soccer program. Also want to thank Jackie, Jacqueline Davis, you know her as Jackie, women's softball coach, as well as senior women's administrator and associate director of athletics, and also Carolyn Ray, career advisor and assistant women's basketball coach. So I want to thank all of them and give them a round of applause as well. Thank you for putting this together. I also want to thank the women who are our panel members this evening. We have six amazingly, incredibly talented women that we are so fortunate who could come and spend some time with us. So you will get to know them a little bit better. I also want to thank all of you student athletes who are here. I want to thank all the coaches and staff and anyone else who is in attendance. It really means a lot to us that you're here and we have a great program. So before I begin, I, before I introduce um, the, the, the panel members and have them talk about themselves a little bit, I just want to kind of put this in context. I want to frame this before we begin. And that is, if any of you have done any research on women uh, athletes in the workplace, you're probably not going to be surprised that those individuals, female student athletes, succeed very well in the workplace. So let me just throw out some stats because I know you're athletes and you love statistics. So here are just a few. So we know that there's an undeniable correlation between athletic sports and workplace success. There just is. If you look it up, you're going to find it. So ESPNW did a recent study. They interviewed over 400 executives, women executives. They're all in the C-suite. And if you're not familiar with the C-suite or the C-level, that's simply a group of executives who are very influential in their organization. And the C, the letter C, is for like chief of staff or chief of police or CEO or whatever. You get the point. So they looked at all these women, 400 women in the C-suite, and they looked at their professional career. And what they found, not surprisingly, 94% of those women who made it as far up as is the C-suite were former athletes. 52% of those women played uh, basketball, or sorry, basketball player, they played college <laughs> sports. So 52 of them played at the collegiate level, but overall 94% of them uh, played some sort of sport competitively. Fortune 500, not a lot of women CEOs. I think the last time I looked, it's about 6%. But of the Fortune 500 women who are CEOs, the highest you can go, 90% of them played competitive sport. So you see the trend here. And then lastly, in 2017, Fortune put out the list of the most powerful women. And they found that 65% of those women who made that list played competitive sports. And the most popular sports that they, the number one sport that was recognized by this list of most influential women, it was a tie for the top sports. It was basketball, swimming, and tennis. Those are the three sports of those women who are that high up. 
So you can see that there's a connection between sport and female success very easily. It's researched, it, it's documented. But you might say, what exactly is the connection? And that's what you're gonna hear a lot of tonight with the panel members. But I just wanna share a little bit about what those women said, these amazing women who are at the top of their game, whether it's Fortune 500 or Fortune or uh, Hewlett Packard was another one that they studied. The connection between sport and success was really drilled down to, I'm gonna say three things, teamwork, it's not a surprise, right? They all said it all started with teamwork, learning about how to build relationships, how to build teams in the workplace. There's no I in teamwork. The second thing that these powerful women mentioned was defeat and setbacks are part of the game. So many of you athletes out there have probably sat out for a couple games, a game or a season. Maybe it was discipline. Maybe it was you blew out your ACL. Maybe it was something else that took you away. There's a lot of setbacks in the game, just like there is in the workplace. And so the women were saying that the defeat and setbacks that you learn as a student athlete were so critical to learning resiliency in the workplace. And then the third thing that I love, these women were saying they learned how to put on their game face they learned how to put it on and look like they're confident, even when they weren't feeling confident. So I remember being at the foul line with zero seconds left and it was 78 to 78. I put that game face on, but I was, my knees were knocking. But these women were saying that you put on your game face, you become super confident. You learn to get yourself a seat at the table and they credited playing sport in terms of giving them that confidence. And then the other thing that I want to mention, and I think this is really important for everyone, not just the student athletes, all of us to remember, Hewlett Packard did a study and they looked at women who went for a promotion. And what they found was that women tend to seek promotions only if they think they meet 100% of the job qualifications. Whereas men at Hewlett Packard said, hey, if I can meet 60% of the job qualifications for that position up there, I'm going to go for it. So I think that's really important that we remember that. You don't have to meet 100% of those job qualifications in order to go for a promotion. So I want to throw that out there. And then finally, the women kept saying, if there's anything I can share with, former, with my former student athletes or current student athletes, it's that they really believe that all of them mentioned they have nerves of steel, that they have bold anticipation. They learned how to anticipate things on the court, on the field, on the swimming pool, wherever you may play. They learned how to anticipate things by playing sports and that helped them tremendously in the workplace. And then the final thing, no surprise to any of you, their drive to win. They learned how to be competitive through sports and they said that has helped them close more deals than they could ever imagine. So just a few things to think about as we start you know, this process of, of hearing from our distinguished panel. And so having said that, I would like to take a moment to talk about this incredible panel that we have with us this evening. The panel is comprised of um, tremendous diversity. We have individuals, they're all former student athletes from Suffolk. They come from different sports. They come from different academic backgrounds, different majors, different minors. Um, they all graduated at different times. Um, they are now working in very different fields and professions, such as the Department of Health and Human Services, Lexington Public Schools, TJX Companies, Salem District Court, the Own Up Company, a startup company, and the New England Patriots. So how's that for diversity? That's quite a distinguished panel that we have, all former student athletes from Suffolk University. So at this time, I would like for them to take some time to introduce themselves. Now we have plenty of time and the student athletes are here to learn from you and listen to what you have to say. So take your time introducing yourself. I'm sure they're gonna to wanna to network, network with you. So they're gonna be writing down things. So I think we'll start with Laura, and that's how I'll kind of proceed one at a time. And if you would, each of you, please um, obviously introduce yourself, your name, your graduation year, 
your major and your sport at Suffolk and maybe tell us a little bit about your title and what you do now. So Laura, why don't we go ahead and start with you? Thanks. Can everyone hear me? Sorry, I, prior to this, I was saying this is my first time using Zoom, um, so sorry about that. Um, but I was saying before that that was amazing, Margie, Margie and um, I loved hearing those statistics. Um, because I was agreeing to a lot of what you've said and where I see myself now. Um, so I'm Laura Thompson. I was a graduate of Suffolk University in 2010. I played women's basketball and I am currently working for the Department of Health and Human Services. And I actually started there right when I graduated. I think I graduated in May of 2010 and I started right up in June, I think, of 2010. So I've been there ever since, and I think that's um, a pretty cool thing. So I am a senior auditor there. I started as, they have different levels of um, grades, like a scale. So I started there as a GS7, and I've worked my way up to a GS13. So I'm now a senior um, auditor, and I run my own audits in the department. Oh, great. Uh, so that's a little a little bit about myself. <laughs> Thank you. And sure. Kelly, how about you? Would you like to go next? Tell us your name, um, your major, what you declared as a major, what you do now, what sport you played. Hi, everyone. And, and thanks for having, uh, having me. I'm excited to be here. And um, I hope you guys learn a lot and take a lot from this. So um, I'm Kelly Herlock, and I graduated in 2009. I played softball at Suffolk and my major was psychology. Uh, currently, I'm a special educator in the Lexington public school system in Lexington, Mass. And I um, oversee and teach kids with autism. Great, thank you very much. Okay, um, how about Katie? Sure, um, thanks again for having me. Um, so my name is Katie Babb, and um, I graduated in 2014 from Suffolk and played uh, women's volleyball for the four years that I was there. Um, and I was a public relations major and marketing minor, uh, and I work for the TJX companies. So that's Marshalls, Home Goods, TJ Maxx, um, and all of those brands for those of you who don't know. Um, and I've been there for about three years or so. I'm a public relations and brand marketing uh, supervisor. And before that, I worked at an advertising agency called Mullen Lowe, doing something very similar, um, just instead of doing it for one brand, doing it for a number of different clients. Um, so I have a little bit of agency side and brand side as well. Um, but I can tell you a little more about what all of that means a little later too, if you want. Um, but yeah, that's a little more about me. Great, thank you very much, Katie. Um, and Erin, how about you? Hi, um, so my name is Erin McAndrews, and I graduated in 2014, and I played softball um, from 2012 to 2014, so three years. Um, and I, after I graduated from Suffolk in 2014, I went on to the University of Massachusetts, where I got my JD, my Juris Doctorate. Um, while I was in law school, I got the opportunity to work for the United States Army down in Fort Benning, Georgia. And then I went on to work for the United States Coast Guard in Boston, both working with the JAGS, which is equivalent to a lawyer for the military. Um, I then worked for two court systems in the Bristol County DA's office and the Essex County DA's office. And now I'm an assistant district attorney with uh, the Salem District Court. So essentially that means um, anything you see on the TV, um, anything you read in the newspaper, anyone who is arrested. Um, immediately comes to court and then um, I'm there with a team. Um, my team's currently about five DAs in our office and we handle everything from the arraignment day um, to motions to jury trials um, and everything in between. Um, so that's kind of what I do now. Great. Thank you, Erin. Uh, Melissa. Good. Hi everyone. I'm Melissa. I graduated in May of 2019. I was a business major at Suffolk so I majored in management and then minored in marketing and professional selling. It's a newer um, minor. Currently, I work for a Boston-based startup called Own Up. I actually started interning my senior year of college, so 
when I started, there was actually a little bit less than 15 people with the company and present day we have over 70. So really cool to see growth within the company. Currently, I'm actually a sales manager. Um, so I started as an intern. I worked in operations sales and now I manage a sales team. So it's a, actually a mortgage company, um, kind of a different space as of currently and uh, really excited to talk about it as well. Great, can't wait to hear more about that. And has Lauren entered the room yet? I don't believe so, no. Okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce the um, other, the last panelist. She's running a little late, she had an obligation. Um, her name is Lauren Spencer, and she's a graduate 2015. She played soccer, her major was print journalism major. So I want to share with you that she is, uh, her title is social media supervisor for the New England Patriots. And she's from Tewksbury, Massachusetts. She became, she came to Suffolk in 2011. She was a four year member of the women's soccer team. She said she met some of her best friends through women's soccer at Suffolk. She had an amazing experience while she was here. She interned and had wonderful real life work experiences with the Boston Celtics and the Boston Globe. That's where it allowed her to get to where she is today. She graduated in 2015 with a degree in journalism and moved to Nashville to work at a seasonal position with the Tennessee Titans. After moving back to Boston, she said she returned for a semester of grad school classes while working as a graduate assistant under athletics in, uh, with Amy Berry. In the spring of 2016, she had an opportunity to work for the Patriots, which she did not decline, of course, and she's been with the organization ever since. She's been fortunate enough to attend four Super Bowls and see the Patriots win two. So it's certainly been an exciting five years since she graduated and she can't wait to see where the next five years takes her. So Lauren will be jumping on momentarily, I'm sure. So that is an incredible panel. I mean, look at the diverse, incredible women that we have and the wealth of experience that they're gonna be able to share with all the student athletes. So with that, what we're gonna do is we have six, seven, eight questions, depending on the time. And I will ask the question and then I will target a few of the uh, panelist members who uh, shared with me earlier that they are very comfortable answering these questions. So let us begin with the first question and I'm gonna direct this one to Laura, Aaron, and Melissa in that order, if I may. So the first question is, how did you choose your major? Did you know exactly what you wanted to do while you were at Suffolk? So I'll let you go ahead and begin, Laura. Um, so I did not know what I wanted to do at Suffolk. Um, so I was undecided for the longest time. Um, I think I reached the point where I was like, I have to make a decision by my, I think I was reaching my junior year. Um, and I think that was mainly because I just, I have so many different interests and I was like, how can you pinpoint one thing that you want to do? It was kind of like a big, a big decision for me. Um, so I guess I basically went with um, what I liked, my subjects I liked the most, so was math, so I decided to go with accounting. Um, and, you know, I actually, because I waited so long, I think I had to take some summer accounting courses just to speed up so that I could graduate in, in time. So, um, yeah, so I ended up with accounting and I was, you know, my parents gave me a lot of advice of you can never go wrong in the accounting field. Um, so, yeah, I went with that and um, the rest was history, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Erin, uh, how about you? So I actually went to Sacred Heart University my first year um, where I played Division I softball and I majored in criminal justice there. Um, however, I knew I wanted to be a lawyer straight out of high school. My parents are lawyers. It's all I've known. Um, but I really didn't feel like at Sacred Heart they had a strong enough program where I knew I could get into a law school or do what I wanted to do. So eventually I made the decision to not play Division I softball anymore and go more towards an academic side of what I wanted to do in college. So that's why I focused uh, when I transferred to schools that I knew either had an attached law school or an established program. So when I chose my major, my major was sociology, and then I minored in politics, laws, and the courts. And one of the best things about Suffolk is in their pre-law program, 
they're actually, a lot of their classes are taught by Suffolk University law school professors. So you're almost getting a head start over a lot of people in those classes because you're already being taught um, at the level or the style. Um, one of the biggest things about law school is it, it's, it's completely nothing like you've ever seen or learned before. It's a totally different way. Um, it's all cold calling. Um, you have to show up every single day reading 500 pages and be ready to go. Um, you, you have to do outlines. You have to teach yourself basically how to learn a different way. So when you go to Suffolk and you get this opportunity to major or minor in politics, laws, and the courts, you're kind of getting that jump start, which is eventually why I chose Suffolk University. I knew they had the law school attached. They have an amazing success rate. Success rate. Uh, people who go to undergrad pre-law, and you can even do a three plus three program where you could graduate with your Juris Doctorate in six years instead of seven years, um, which is a great opportunity for most people. So that's why I ended up choosing Suffolk for their pre-law program, um, and that was my major that I chose. Great. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. And uh, Melissa? When I was kind of deciding my major, I wasn't a hundred percent sure. I knew I had really enjoyed business because I had the opportunity to take business classes in high school at the college level, which was definitely a plus when coming to Suffolk because all of those credits did transfer over. Mm -hmm. For a while, I was in between management and marketing, um, and I had the ability to double major, which ended up being a, a double minor instead. But um, I didn't a hundred percent know what I wanted to do. Suffolk had a lot of different programs within real estate, sales, marketing. Um, I think the business school is great in the sense that it's so broad and you do end up getting a lot of opportunity. In terms of choosing Suffolk and how Suffolk even helped me to choose my major, the fact that you're going to school in a city, I think opens a world of opportunities. Um, I think one of the thoughts I had always had was, I wish I had a school with a big campus. The city really is your campus and it it truly opens a lot of opportunities. It kind of helped me choose business in that way, just in the sense that I was given um, several different opportunities with business, which kind of directed me uh, right towards that major. Great, thank you. Um, one thing I want to mention about that is um, I had taught many years in higher education. At one point, the statistic was a student changes major an average of five times during a four or five year program at in higher ed. So for the students who are out there, you're not really sure what you want to study, that's okay. But as the panel members were saying, it's really important to use people to figure things out, try internships, try summer programs, work with your academic advisor, talk to your teammates, talk to your coaches. So I think it was Laura had mentioned, you may not have to decide until your junior year, take classes that interest you. So, but it, it's not uncommon to change your major a lot. So thank you to the panel for that question and answer. I appreciate that. We were just uh, discussing why did, what major did you choose and why did you choose that? How did you know you wanted that major when you were at Suffolk? You want to jump right in? Uh, yes. So I, um, I was a print journalism major when I was at Suffolk and I think at the time everyone, everyone was kind of steering me in a different direction um, and saying that print journalism was on its way out and you know broadcast or different different avenues would, would have been the one to pursue but um, that was originally the avenue I, I wanted to pursue after college but I think overall it just kind of helped me develop a strong writing background and led me to a lot of other opportunities that were still within that same realm um, so I, I still found it super helpful and I, you know, I can carry those same skills as I'm, I work in social media now, but I'm, I'm taking my journalism background with me and kind of adapting as the digital age sort of adapts. So um, it was always kind of something I wanted to do. That's what led me to choose it when I got to Suffolk. But even though, you know, people aren't reading long news articles the way they used to, I think that um, it was definitely still beneficial and, and I could really util utilize a lot of the skills that I learned. Great. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll keep moving along and we'll have questions and answers anytime at the end of a question or at the end of the program. So I'll keep my eyes out for that. So the second question, um, I'll throw this out to Katie and Aaron and Lauren and Kelly, if you would like. What did you do at Suffolk that helped you move in the direction of your professional goals? 
and maybe what did you wish you had done that you hadn't? So why don't we start with uh, Katie? Yeah, sure. So my answer to this question um, is actually the same for both parts of this question. <laughs> um, and I think that would probably be take advantage of the resources uh, around me. And so, I mean, Suffolk, it's, it's not necessarily that you're just only getting, you know, the world-class education around you, but you also have, you know, access to all of these world-class resources as well and people and professors and tools. And um, I was very fortunate and thankful to um, be able to network and to, you know, you know, meet coaches and peers and have professors who, you know, if you just take five minutes after class and, you know, get to actually know the people around you and have, you know, coffee with a professor or just, you know, even have a conversation with them, you'd be surprised how far that can go and how much that can impact your entire trajectory. Um, for example, you know, I was a PR and marketing major and, um, Greg Gatlin, who is now the VP of um, communications, he was my intro to PR, PR 101. He was my professor. And um, I think he, he's not, you know, I think he was like rotating um, in his, I don't know if he's, he teaches classes regularly, but he just so happened to be. And I kind of asked how he like landed in this role, if he teaches normally and, and things like that. And, you know, he has so much experience in, the industry and to not take advantage of um, that opportunity and the people around you. And so I ended up asking him um, if I could just sort of lurk around his office for like an hour a week as part of my work study. I mean, I'm sure most of you, if you haven't already taken advantage of the work study in, in the athletic department, because it's by far the best work study program um, on campus. And I think everyone can attest to that. <laughs> um, I was able to split my work study program um, between the athletic department and then one hour a week in his office, just getting to know a little more about what they do and um, you know, PR and public affairs. And it was a very different world from what you're learning in the classroom. But um, then that led me to one of his contacts having an internship opening and he just helped me make that connection. And that led to the next internship, which led to the next internship. And it's all about the relationships you build, and especially in PR. I mean, that's what the industry is all about. It's building relationships and um, sort of networking. And that's honestly, I can honestly say that I've not applied for a single job since I have graduated college. It's all been through networking and relationships and either being recruited in that sense. And it all started from one conversation in my PR 101 class with Greg Gatlin, which wow. is, I know it's kind of crazy to say that, but, it, <laughs> and that was, I feel like I barely scratched the surface from using those resources. So I can only imagine if I had done it more, what would that have turned into? Great. Thank you very much. Erin, how about you? Um, so I have two things. Um, so first of all, I guess I, I guess I lied a little bit. So I had a deep passion I wanted to be a police detective before I wanted to be a lawyer. And um, I went to Suffolk University and there was this class and it was essentially like forensic science for police officers class. And I was like, I gotta take this class. I gotta take it. It ended up being all biochemistry majors. And I was so lost, so confused. I did horrible, but Suffolk University gave me so many opportunities. Um, to really kind of weed out within my major or outside my major. I mean, I took marketing classes. I took so many different classes, but kind of stayed focused. Um, so I, thank God I took that class. And then I was like, all right, I'm done with that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna carry on to be a lawyer. I'm, that's behind me. I know I can't do that, but he gave me so many opportunities and kind of tying that in, just take advantage of every single thing you can. One of the biggest things I regret is that I never studied abroad. It's huge at Suffolk. They have so many opportunities. I know with COVID, that's kind of on pause, but there were so many opportunities. Um, people were going to Spain, um, Italy. They were doing all these amazing programs, and it's something that I never took advantage of, um, and it was something that I always wanted to do. So take every class you can. If you see anything that interests you, I took um, uh, a domestic terrorism class that was amazing. I took marketing. I took advertisement. I took something almost in every major. 
um, and it really just opens your eyes and that's kind of how you can have a kind of fast track to really what you want to do because you're going to be able to see how people are in all different environments. Um, so just take advantage of every single thing you can. Suffolk offers so many extracurricular activities or opportunities. You just want to soak it all up when you're in college. Great, thank you very much, Erin. Uh, Lauren, how about you? Uh, <laughs> so two things for me, I think, um, that I took advantage of or and would encourage others to also is just suffix. I think this is something that the school has always prided itself on, but close proximity to the downtown Boston area and just to surrounding internships. So, um, I mean, I, Suffolk is right in the center of everything. And I, I had an internship my junior year at the Boston Globe and then the Boston Celtics my senior year. So those were really two huge boosters on my resume. And I could leave for work at the Celtics like five minutes before I had to because I lived so close. So it was really great just being in that kind of environment and, and being so nearby to so many great opportunities. And then the other thing I think there was um, a point that I kind of always kind of hold on to, although it seemed minor at the time, was that Suffolk had a, and probably still does have a job shadow program um, and that I did as a sophomore. It was a one day job shadow. And it was at the time where I was still kind of exploring what I might want to do and trying to open up to some new possibilities. So I did a job shadow for a one day um, program at a, an advertising firm in downtown Boston. And I left that day and I didn't really love it. I was like, I don't know that I could see myself doing this. I think I might want to check advertising off the list. And I, I still found that as such a valuable experience because, you know, not everyone's going to realize that in one day, but I didn't spend a whole six months in an internship or I didn't pursue a career and get a major there and get a job in that industry and then decide I didn't like it after college. So I think just what I took away from that is, is try new things. And even if it's a bad experience, it's a good experience because you realize it's not, maybe that's not the direction you want to go in and it allows you to, to explore the things you do want. So um, those are my, my two biggest things that what they both have in common is just experience and trying to gain as much of it as possible. Great, thank you for that. Yes, and um, Carolyn just put out the job sharing program that you mentioned uh, actually does still exist at Suffolk for students. So we're very excited about that. Uh, Kelly, how about you? Uh, yeah, I would have to second um, mostly everything everyone said. I think it's really important to um, step outside of the box a little bit and do things that you may not be totally comfortable with. You're in a big city, uh, take advantage of that, go out, explore, meet new people. Um, there's tons of things around, tons of museums and historical things that you can use to um, dig through some interests that you may not know you had. Um, I also think taking advantage of internship programs and work study experiences are really helpful um, and can give you sort of a foundation uh, for some job skills and some interpersonal skills that are super important uh, for your careers. So thank you for that. That was really interesting. The um, third question is directed to Kelly, Laura, Katie, and Melissa. If you'd like to jump in, love to hear from you as well. What skills did you acquire as a student athlete at Suffolk that you use in your job today? So why don't we start with Kelly? All right. Well, I mean, I think that's, this is a no brainer. Um, I just, a little background, I teach a functional life skills class of, of many classes that I teach with kids with autism. And I always start um, sort of our year talking about um, joining clubs and being an athlete and how these things sort of tie into your academic and your career successes. And um, one big thing that I learned at Suffolk that I, I use a lot is sort of a growth mindset and um, how, you know, failures help us grow and that actually, you know, without failures, we probably wouldn't be where we are today. Um, I know I've failed at many things in my life and I would say I'm, I'm a pretty successful educator and I make great relationships with my friends, but it took me a while to get to where I am and to, to see that success. I mean, of course, um, teamwork and dedication, time management, all of those things, um, you know, I've learned, I learned through, through college, I learned through playing sports in high school, and I think it's just part of being an athlete and being a um, successful community member. Great, thank you. Uh, Laura, how about you? 
Um, so I also, I just want to add to the second question that we just had, um, because again, I don't know if this is something that still happens at Suffolk. Um, I went to a job fair at Suffolk one time when I was, I think I was in my senior year, and that's actually how I got into working for the government, because there was a panelist at the job fair, and, um, I just went up to him. It was it was because my roommate pushed me. I was a nervous a nervous senior in college, and she was like, "Just go up to him, give him your resume, and you know, see see what happens from there." And it's ironic that he was on the panelist, and I ended up getting the job. And I I work on audits with him now, so it's it's funny because he also went to Suffolk. So um, yeah. to to think now that we've worked on jobs together, and I was that. Um, scared senior going up to him. It's just a, just a funny backstory, but I just wanted to also add that. I didn't know if Suffolk still has like job fairs and stuff, but that's how I got to um, my current job. So to answer your third question, um, I would agree with Kelly. Um, and also I'd like to add that it's helped me be organized because you're juggling so many different things when you're in college and you're your time management skills um, are essential because you have to plan out your classes and you have to make sure you're at practice on time. And I think being organized has really helped me in my field now because with audits, you're just, um, you get so much documentation and you have to hold so many interviews with um, different oddities. So I think it's really helped me um, to be organized in my field now. Great. Thank you for that. I want to just chime in before I, I ask Mel Melissa to also participate. I think it's interesting what you said about being organized because I remember the statistic that student athletes GPAs always are higher during season than off season. And it's because we're so disciplined during season, we know what we have to do, when we have to do it, where to be. It's during the off season that the GPAs, if they tend to dip, it's usually at that time. Right, and I'd also like to add, just because my coach um, is on here now, um, the constructive criticism that I got from coach um, when I maybe wasn't performing like I should have, or he just really wanted me to rebound more than I was rebounding. I think learning um, constructive criticism during that time and bringing that into the into the work field is huge because like Kelly said, you're, you're not always going to be right in everything that you do. So I think that's helped me as well. Um, given the constructive criticism that I got when I was an athlete. Good point. So thanks Good point. coach. <laughs> <laughs> he says, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> Melissa, would you like to jump in? Of course. Um, first thing I'd like to say is I think a lot of the skills that we have are all so second nature. And until we actually really reflect on them, we don't truly see them as skills. Uh, to what Laura just said in terms of the criticism and feedback or constructive criticism, a lot of that is hindsight where coach would give me a lot of uh, constructive, criticism, constructive criticism and feedback and I didn't always agree with her. Hindsight She's probably right 98% of the time. And I think as you enter the workforce, being able to take on that type of feedback that you're receiving, being able to think about it, reflect on it, and then make a thoughtful opinion or um, decision based on that is extremely helpful. I do a lot of hiring and onboarding in my company. And one thing I like is I love hiring Suffix. Um, and I think a lot of people from Suffolk can agree with that. But the biggest thing that being a student athlete taught me was the ability to be coachable. In any job, you will not see movement if you're not coachable. And being a student athlete is probably the number one thing that I've learned is being able to be coachable, even if you don't always agree with it, being able to kind of make adjustments and adapt to the situation that you're in. I think, um, of course, the skill is being really hardworking. I I've I would credit soccer to being able to manage my time properly, but I definitely saying uh, being adaptable and being coachable are true are two of the biggest skills that I was able to gain uh, from being a student athlete. 
Excellent. Great. Wonderful responses. And I know most of you can see the, the comments in the chat room, but just to reiterate that the job fair that someone mentioned does still happen. It usually happens the end of February and early March. So just want to put that in in case people are not reading the chat rooms. So wonderful. Thank you for that. Great insight. The fourth question is um, directed towards Lauren, Laura, and Katie. How is your experience as a student athlete, a former student athlete, how is that mirrored in the workplace today? And what are some of the similarities? So what's your experience as a female student athlete? How is that mirrored in the workplace today? And what are some of the similarities? So we'll ask uh, Lauren. Um, I think one of the biggest similarities I've noticed is I'm, I think that's something we all have in common as we were, we were female student athletes and I work in sports now, so it's definitely a male dominated industry. Um, so I'm lucky that my direct department and, and most of our organization is pretty split even, but across the board, it's definitely still women are not always, you know, at the front of in positions of power or in leadership roles. So um, it's something that I think being a student athlete kind of helps because women's professional sports isn't at the same same level that men's professional sports are yet. So it's kind of something as student athletes that we take a little pride in as being the semi minority or under appreciated as, um, you know, in the sports space, whether that's in athletics himself or in the workplace related to sports. So um, that's kind of something that I've noticed as a parallel and it, it's motivated me to still, you know, continue to try to knock down the doors and, and thrive in those places. And also um, just a, an overall similarity is the lessons that we learned kind of going back into the last question is time management, how to be coachable, how to grow and how to move forward, um, how to speak up and, and generate kind of self-confidence. Um, sports is something that helped all of us, I think, in college grow and become more confident. And it's something that um, we can carry over into the workplace too as we as we continue to grow in that space. So those are the two similarities I think I've found. Great, thank you very much. Laura, how about you? Um, I The first thing that came to my mind was just being a team player because in our office, um, we never work on an audit by ourselves. We're always working with other people. So I think that has definitely helped me be more um, adaptable and more approachable. And um, it's just helped communication wise to, um, you know, working in a team. There's nothing like, you know, working in a team, but then having that one person that you know, isn't cooperating or they're not really like on board or they keep, they keep information from you. So I think um, being a team player and working in a, in a team setting has definitely um, helped in my, in my field. Great. Thank you. Katie, how about you? Yeah, so I think actually something that you mentioned earlier um, is actually something that stuck with me very well and is my exact answer for this. And I would say that's resiliency. So my first job um, coming out of college was at an advertising agency. And so if any of you have ever watched the show Mad Men, you can imagine something maybe somewhat similar to that. <laughs> um, and so, you know, as a female student athlete and um, you know, a female in a very male dominated industry, even though PR may be a female dominated industry, advertising is not, um, you know, being able to, you know, have that resiliency and, and learning skills and, um, you know, being able to exude self-confidence. And those are things that you do learn um, through sports and being able to um, just sort of like, you know, tough through it and stick with it. And, um, but, you know, know when the right time to speak up is and stand up for yourself um, and, you know, fight for the promotions that you deserve. And when you see other colleagues, you know, going after for some going after a promotion that, you know, maybe they might not be qualified for, but you know that you're qualified for, you know, go for it as well and in things like that. And so I would say that that's something that for sure athlete or athletics has absolutely helped with and can that, you know, definitely translate into the workplace too. And especially at your first job, you know, within the first year, that's scary. Like you don't know what it's like and you don't know if that's something you should be doing. And you kind of have to feel out the nature of, of the place that the 
I guess the culture that you're in and, and what it's like, but um, I think Suffolk sets you up for a good groundwork of how to be able to, you know, take account of your surroundings and where you are and, you know, just sort of live that resiliency through and through. Great. Yeah, I hear resilient resiliency come through loud and clear through a lot of you. And also you talk about basically getting a seat at the table like you, you have that confidence. And so you're you may not be invited, but you're going to find a way to get at that table and find yourself a seat. And I like what you said too, Katie, about the promotion. Um, that's going back to that research that I said at the very beginning, and particularly for the students who may have come in a little late. You know, women often feel that they have to master 100% of the job qualifications before they even think about applying versus 60% of men say, I, no, excuse me, men would say, if I can reach 60% or if I feel like I can probably meet 60% of the job qualifications for that particular job, I'm going to go for it. So to your point, Katie, find it within you and say, you do not have to master everything. You don't have to go in order. You don't have to go step by step up the ladder. You can jump, you can go diagonal. So just have that confidence and you know you have it when you're an athlete, and use it into the workplace. So thank you, great, great. All right, the fifth question that we have is for Aaron, Melissa and Kelly, and that is, what do you do now? And really anybody can jump in on this one, but I'm directing it, Aaron, uh, Melissa and Kelly at first. What do you do now? What does your day to day look like? And then I'm gonna throw in a little off the script. Can you tell us a little bit about what you like best and least, if you're willing? So what do you do now? What's your day to day look like? And maybe tell us what you like and what you don't like, if you're willing to share. Aaron. Okay, starting with me. Um, so as I mentioned, I am an assistant district attorney. Um, I work for Essex County District Attorney's Office. So we have about six courts. We have Haverhill, uh, Lawrence, Lynn, Salem. So I'm in the Salem office. I was in the Lynn office. So the best part of my job is that every single day, is, it's never gonna be the same. Um, so even if you have a bad day the day before, you're, you're never gonna see the same thing the next day. So when you are an assistant district attorney, you're in charge of the entire part of a criminal proceeding. So the first step is the arraignment session is when you're arraigned formally on charges. They, we also have motion sessions, which are, you know, live testimony with officers on whether the individual's rights were violated or the constitution was violated. Um, we do jury trials, we do bench trials. I've done about a little over 50 trials. Um, Another part of my job is I am the supervisor of the juvenile court. So when you're under the age of 18 in Massachusetts, you're charged in the juvenile court. So I run that court as well. Um, it's a little bit of a different side of the law. It's a lot more uh, guidance and uh, trying to get these kids um, so we don't see them as an adult ever again in these district courts. So trying to get them the help they need. Um, so those are kind of what you rotate through every day. You could be in arraignments one day, you could be doing a trial the next day, uh, you could do in motion one day. So if you're not in the mood one day, you know, it could be a great day the next day or vice versa. So that's, that's the thing I love. In some lawyers aren't in court every day. Um, sometimes they're at their desk. Um, we're always on the move. We're in court every single day. We're upstairs, we're in front of the judge. Um, and one of the best parts about the Essex County DA's office is we really pride ourselves in that we are 80% female. Um, in my office, alone in Lynn, when I was there, we were 100% female, so 24 of us. Um, so we are one of the uh, highest uh, female uh, DA's office, which is great. We usually outnumber the guys on most uh, occasions. Um, there really is, I can't think of anything I hate about my job. Um, it's what I've wanted to do my entire life. I, I purposely set up every intern that I did just to get to this position. Um, it is stressful. It's high pace, almost like a softball game. I mean, every jury trial is a game almost. Uh, you have to get up there in front of seven or 12 people that you don't know. Everyone's staring at you. Um, in the spotlights on you and you have to have uh, you know what we said earlier is this superhero power in this space that 
I'm, I know what I'm talking about and I'm going to convince you. Um, so that's some of the huge takeaways. Also, um, we talked about anticipation. It's the same thing on a jury trial or a bench trial. You know, you want it. What is their strategy? What am I going to do? Um, what do I need to do to beat them? Um, so you take a lot of sports into that consideration, which is why I love jury trials. It's really almost like a chess game. You got to out, out think, out talk, out convince, and just, you know, it's almost like a show that you have to put on and you have to be brave. And even if you don't want to be brave sometimes and you're scared half the time, the first time you do it, but um, sports is 100% something that really, you can see who had played sports in their lives. When you have to get up there and you don't want to get up there or you're, you're scared and you're nervous, you know, we are thrown in these situations all the time in sports. You know, sometimes you don't want to be up there with two outs and the game's on the line, but we all learn to adapt to that. And that's something you really take into the, once you graduate. Great. Thank you very much for that, Erin. When, when you were just talking, it brought back something about one of those research studies that I was uh, referring to earlier. A number of the women CEOs say that when they walk into a board meeting, they can tell who played sports by their posture, which I thought was fascinating. So it made me sit up a little bit more during this panel presentation. But uh, I thought that was fascinating how you can read people and just get a sense of who played sports. So thank you, Aaron. Uh, Melissa, how about you? Great. Um, so a little bit what about I, what I do on the day to day. Um, I know I mentioned this, but I work for a Boston based mortgage company. So I'll give you a little bit of background on my company. But Essentially, um, what we do is we work to help people get a fair deal on their mortgage. Um, I don't want to go too much into banking, but the banking industry is very um, outdated and archaic. So we really utilize our technology to help people save money over the lifetime of a loan. It can sound boring, but it's actually really interesting. And I'd consider myself one of the biggest mortgage nerds. And I hated finance and accounting in college. Um, but on a day-to-day, -day, I work with a lot of customers. Um, I work with a direct team, so I know I had mentioned this earlier, but I've gotten to the point where I manage a team of about nine people. So I focus on a territory, primarily in Texas and Pennsylvania, although I do a lot in the Boston area. So our quarter actually just ended yesterday, quarter three. So it's really great to be able to work with the team and see their goals. And I really like what Aaron said earlier, because you can truly see who is an athlete um, just based off of their competitive drive. And I love working with people to get them up to that next level, um, as well as continuing the hiring process as well. Um, I think we hired about nine people this quarter and through the end of the year, it'll be 12. So it's really great. And I will say we do kind of look at student athletes as well, um, just because they do bring different types of talent. In terms of what I like and what I don't like, I think my favorite thing about the company is one that it's a growing company. We're for profit, but we're mission driven. Um, we truly care about helping people at the end of the day, educating them, um, and just knowing that we're doing right by consumers. That's something that is really important to me. Pre own up, I did work uh, in AmeriCorps for a little bit, and I worked in low income housing, and I swore that I would never uh, work for profit. I thought it'd only be nonprofit, but um, I was able to kind of see multiple sides and that you can actually work for a for profit company and help people at the end of the day. I think one thing I probably dislike about my company, which is, is it, it's a good problem to have um, for any type of startup, but there's never uh, as many hours in the day as there is work. There's always work to be done and uh, it can be tiring, but it's really great knowing that every single person I work with has the same goals in mind at the end of the day, um, because there's a lot of collaboration and teamwork that goes on as well. Great. Thank you so much for that, Melissa. And uh, Kelly, how about you? Yeah, so um, currently I'm an educator. I'm a special educator. I also am a coach in district, like I said, and I'm also a student myself. I'm back in school for a uh, second master's degree in something called transition services, which is um, overseeing students transition from college, I mean, I'm sorry, high school to college or the workforce or um, to, you know, apartment living, whatever it has to be with um, students, it could be transitioning students, um, you know, from going like their parents are always driving them around to them transitioning to taking public transportation. So it just depends on 
the, each individual student. Um, I'm a teacher for students with autism. I teach a, a, a history class, a functional life skills class. I've done health classes. Um, so I, I've done a wide range of things. Before becoming an educator in a public school, I worked at a residential facility for students with autism, an international school, which um, was very cool and very challenging. Um, now that I'm in a public school, I would say it's not as challenging because I don't deal so much with student behaviors. Uh, in the residential school, you know, I was like getting bit and hit and um, that at the same time trying to educate kids. Um, so it was a little bit different, but my day to day now is um, educating kids in a small group setting, working on, you know, the interpersonal skills and academic skills that are really important, um, taking curriculum and breaking it down into, ch into tiny chunks and really just making sure that students are set up for success and that they are able to learn in a way that helps them and that they're able to fit into their community um, just like everybody else. You know, I, I really pride my students in that of like, at least if you leave my classroom, you have dignity and respect for yourself and for others. And um, that's definitely something I learned being a, a student athlete as well. And I, I just think that's really important for our youth now and I take you know some of those classroom things that I do onto the field and onto the court when I'm coaching and I have middle schoolers um, on my softball team and a lot of it is just like taking criticism respecting your elders respecting your coaches um, and when we don't show respect and we don't work hard then here's a punishment and you know or, or not a punishment but something to do to get us better so it's like all right let's get on the line let's run a little bit you know what I mean so it's like pushing kids and and I and I love to do that and that's how I am in my classroom that's how I am um I I guess really for my for my whole life I feel like I'm I'm constantly like working to push people to to do better um and so that's what I do other than the day-to-day -day paperwork and planning lessons and that the crap stuff of the job um <laughs> I really enjoy the 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 relationships that I make with students and families and um learning you know every day different ways to reach kids who are struggling and um, need a lot of help. Great, no, oh, really good. Wow, teaching, that's, you know, kind of lends itself to the next question that I think, I mean, anybody can uh, probably talk about this, but I'll direct it at Lauren, Kelly, and Katie. But we have to ask a question about COVID-19 and the pandemic and protocol and what's happening, you know, in your world. So what are some of the challenges that you're facing right now in the work due to COVID-19? And how have you been adaptable? And how have you stayed motivated? And those of you who lead a team, how do you keep people safe, but yet, you know, focused on the mission and the target? So Lauren, Kelly, and Katie, so why don't we go ahead and start with um, Lauren, if we will. Yeah, so, um, so I run social media accounts for the New England Patriots. So we started out in March when we all started working from home, we kind of were presented with the new challenge. Usually the off season is just keeping fans engaged while there aren't games happening. But in general, it was kind of like, how can we help people or how can we be some sort of a distraction or, or entertainment for when people are just glued to their screens now and they have nowhere to go or little social interaction. So our strategy and our goals kind of changed throughout the off season um, in addition to our, our regular um, sort of content. But then as we moved into the season, um, we're facing a whole different set of challenges just why I was a little bit late tonight. So um, we're traveling to the game on, on uh, Sunday in Kansas City, but have to go through a whole protocol of daily testing. And the team is testing daily and you can't be around other people and you wear these tracking devices so that you can't stay you know, within six feet of other people. And they're really just trying to keep the environment controlled so that the players stay safe and the season can go on as normal as possible. Um, but we're trying to cover it from a content standpoint and still try to bring fans the same level of access as we had as best as we can. So um, it's definitely tricky and we're still working from home other than really being in person for games. So communication with our team has been a little bit um, tricky, but I think after six or seven months of this, we're all trying to, we're kind of adapted and, um, and trying to carry new processes over. So it's been, it's been a challenge, but hopefully, you know, we're learning as we go. 
and the fans appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. Um, Kelly, how about you? Yeah, so I think all of you students in here probably know exactly the struggles that I'm going, you know, having and, and my students are having. Um, uh, staying motivated, I, I don't know. I just, I make sure that I have something that I like to do every day. I like to, to work out. So I make sure I do that before I start my day um, so that, you know, I'm ready to go. I switch up my environment at home so that I have different places to work here in my house. And I also utilize my classroom while, um, you know, the kids are at home learning. So I, I go and I teach some lessons from my classroom just to change the environment up. Um, I think it goes without saying that wearing masks in the workplace is really difficult. Um, it's tough to do. Just keep in mind that things are going to get better and, and I'm, I'm doing it to, to, you know, keep everyone around me safe and keep my team safe. The last thing I would want to do is come in sick and get one of my colleagues sick. Um, and I think that's, you know, motivation within, a, of it, within itself. Great. Thank you for that, Kelly. And yeah, teachers. Wow. A lot of, a lot of difficulties there. Uh, Katie, how about you? Yeah. So um, I guess to start, a lot of people, um, you know, they say they work in marketing or PR and no one has any idea what that really means because people who work in marketing and PR can do a million different things. Um, but we do do a million different things. Um, so my day to day, I mean, it can, what I love a lot about my job is it looks so different every single day. So, I mean, before COVID, um, I was going to New York every other week for photo shoots and events and meeting with the media and um, doing interviews. And pretty much my job is anything where we want Marshalls or TJ Maxx or Home Goods, we want them to be represented in a good light or our brand is out there in a public way. I'm there to make sure it's the right way. Um, and it's out there in a lot of ways. <laughs> so if there's like a big billboard or a big ad campaign, I'm there to make sure that it's authentic and our message is out there. And that also means on social media and reviewing things and it can be a lot. And so when COVID came, I mean, that completely, you know, from a marketing perspective, changed everything. I mean, for one, you know, it's working from home. It's not necessarily just changing up your day to day, but it's also, you know, understanding the needs of, you know, your consumers and your stores. And we have 300,000 employees across the world. And, you know, my job is, um, one of my main jobs is to, you know, read all of our like Instagram comments and things like that. And, you know, a big part of my job was to, you know, inform like our CEO of, you know, letting them know, I'm like, Hey, everyone's freaking out about COVID-19. Like this is getting really serious. This is really dangerous. Like, I think we should probably close our stores. Like mm -hmm. I know this is something we've never done before, but like, this is a big deal and you know getting all of the right people the right information to make like really critical and serious decisions that have very big impacts um so i didn't sleep for about like three weeks <laughs> <laughs> and but once everything calmed down getting back to um a marketing perspective it's also taking into consideration everything going on in the world and what are the messages that we're putting out there and what are things happening with um you know racial injustice and just from like a branding perspective, you know, how do you show up as a brand and, and what's like an authentic way? And so those are all the things that like before I was going, you know, traveling every other week and, you know, being at a photo shoot. And now I'm sitting here, just, you know, in my living room every day trying to think more strategically. And so my job while I'm doing the same thing is totally shifted, but um, I think it's making us all think very differently about how we're doing things. But um, it's, been it's been great but at the same time too it's you know also I think something that you learn through sports um ever I know everyone's mentioned it like a hundred times tonight but time management is like the biggest yeah. biggest thing because when you're sitting in your living room or um you know just logging on to the computer every day it's, it's very easy just to log on and stay on and not log off um but finding moments to take moments for yourself, get out for a walk if you can, or, you know, do something to, you know, unwind a little bit and not work all night. Um, those are the moments that, you know, make the difference and help tr sort of change things up a little bit. Right. Well, good. Thank you for sharing that. Appreciate that. 
Um, wow, so it's 617, and so I have one more question that I'm gonna ask everybody on the panel if they'll participate. And that is, the final question is, if you could give your suffix self some one piece of advice, what would it be? So I'm just gonna go randomly in the list of Kelly, Katie, Laura, Aaron, Lauren, and Melissa. So Kelly, how about you? What would you give your suffix self? My suffix self, I would say um, it's okay to screw up. It's okay to fail. Keep pushing on. Um, everyone's trying their best all the time. And if you can say you're trying your best and you make a mistake or, or you oversleep and you don't turn something in or, or you make a, a social error where you're, you're doing something you're not supposed to do in the community, um, there's room to, to fix it. So, you know, um, and I would say that would be advice for myself when I was young too. It's okay to mess up. It's okay to make mistakes. As long as you learn from your mistakes and move forward, that's what's most important. Great. Couldn't agree more. Uh, Katie, how about you? Um, I would say that there isn't one path that's the right path. There are multiple paths that can be the right path for someone. When I was about to graduate, I think everyone thought that I was going to grad school. I thought I was going to grad school and I um, was super excited. I bought an apartment in New York. I thought I was going to Columbia. I was really pumped and I took an internship and then two weeks before classes started in New York, um, my internship convinced me not to go and um, told me stay in Boston, don't go to school, you're gonna be, um, the, the degree that you're going to get, you're gonna be applying for the same exact job that we're offering you right now. Um, and so there's no one right path. I mean, for some degrees you do need, or for some jobs you do need a second degree or post-secondary degree or wh whatever it may be, but you don't be afraid to change your path and don't be afraid to follow a different course and change your mind. It's okay. And it will work out. Good. And it will work out. That's for sure. Thank you. Laura, how about you? Um, I highly agree with um, what's been said so far. Um, I think just trusting, trusting yourself and having that confidence in yourself is something that I would totally tell my um, Suffolk um, self when I was in college is just to trust your gut and to trust um, that whatever decision that you make is going to eventually put you in the right direction. Um, and I just had one more thought and I lost it. Um, yeah, I think it's just the confidence in yourself and um, yeah, putting your best foot forward is always gonna be, um, it's never gonna let you down. Um, so I think that's what I would tell myself. Good, take that chance. What are you waiting yeah. for? Yeah. Right, thank you very much, Laura. Erin, how about you? So the, the one thing I would say to myself was to be patient. I did a lot of internships when I was in college and law school. And at one point I didn't, I wasn't liking them like I thought I would, like I would have that aha moment, like this is what I want to do. I was like, oh, you know, this isn't really what I want to do. And I, I started to get frustrated or scared that am I ever going to find like that aha moment, like this is the exact job that I want to do. Um, but you will find it. You're gonna do a number of internships, some you're not gonna like, um, like the advertising job that was mentioned earlier, that's just not for you. So it's really just staying patient and knowing that you're gonna find your way and you're gonna find the exact job that you were meant to be. It's just gonna take a little time. Great, and patience, oftentimes we're, as athletes, we're not good about that. So that's great advice, have some patience. Thank you very much. Uh, Lauren, how about you? Uh, I think I would first off echo Laura's point about confidence. It's something that maybe just comes with personal growth as you get older and, and you're more, in, you know, settled into the workplace. But I find myself being like, I wouldn't have done this when I was in college or I wouldn't have spoken up about that. Um, and why not that? You know what I mean? When you're when you're it was only five or six years ago. So um, being confident in yourself, trusting yourself taking advantage of opportunities like we kind of mentioned earlier and taking advantage of all Suffolk has to offer um, and Boston has to offer. And also like was mentioned, I think, I, I mean, kind of not putting so much force and effort into like, what is my first job out of college gonna be and putting so much stress on yourself. I, you know, had this path I wanted to follow and, you know, took the steps to get there, but I had two additional internships after I graduated college before I got my first full-time job. 
Um, and I think I, you know, during college, I would have been like, I can't have any more internships. I, I need to get a job right away. And um, those two positions ended up leading me, leading me to where I am now. So um, kind of just trusting the process, having patience, really echoing what everyone else was saying, but um, having faith that everything will kind of fall into place and just enjoying college while you're at it too. <laughs> Right, enjoy it while it's there. Great, thank you very much, Lauren. Appreciate that. And Melissa, yeah, how about I you? Would, sorry, yeah, I would definitely also agree with everything that's been said. Um, two small pieces. The first is, I think a lot of us, myself specifically, I'm definitely a perfectionist. I tell myself all the time, this is not life or death. If you get a C on a test, it doesn't define your future. If you have an internship that you don't like, it doesn't mean you have to take or a job that you work in or a class that you take just because you don't like it, it's okay. It's not life or death. We can all figure these things out later. Uh, it's definitely a journey. And um, I like to say, just ride the wave. Um, second thing, especially at Suffolk and being in a city, take every single opportunity that you get and capitalize on it. Um, if you request all of us on LinkedIn after, I'm sure we'll all accept. Um, short example, I'm sure a lot of you know, Andrew Asper, he, uh, he plays on the baseball team. I met him through a professor at a random uh, resume event, and now he's my intern. Um, he just randomly came up to me and said, I really like your company. So I think capitalizing on any opportunity, even if you second guess yourself, just do it, go for it. Um, I think Margie and somebody else had mentioned that women don't often um, go for opportunities unless they're almost 100% certain. I feel that way. I'd also recommend uh, the book, nice girls don't get the corner office. It kind of uh, highlights to a lot of that um, and will bring you confidence uh, within reading it and being in that workforce. That's great, uh, very much. All of you, I wish, I wish I could have listened to you when I was back in college. Like if I could have heard all this advice, um, uh, it would have been uh, something incredible. So I'm thankful that we're getting to share this with this, the student athletes currently at Suffolk.